The excitement continues. Thank you. The excitement continues. Uh, so today we're going to do exercise two, but I wanted to check first of all um, with you about homework one. Are you all good on homework one? Yes? Okay. Okay. I, I've got a homework. I've got it here. Oh, can you? Mm-hmm. A little bit more. Is. Okay, so I've had this question actually from more than one person. And so the result here, so E is the uh, calculation that's the latitude at Salt Lake City and New York City. So it's nearly horizontal um, and 40 degrees roughly on latitude. So you get a distance this way on E and then uh, you get a distance... Um, for G, which is, I guess, this G, there, yeah, the great circle distance, and then finally from the one that takes the um, processing in ArcGIS. G, mm, yes. Yeah, use project the coordinates from part I to calculate the so distance from Salt Lake City to New York. So there's three different distances here. Yeah, for question J. Sorry, sorry, reconcile your answer to F with results from I. Ah, reconcile your question from F. What's F? The term that is in Salt Lake City is north of latitude and origin with I. Oops, I think there's a mistake there. Dr. Tarleton, could you comment on this? Um, I'm just looking at it. So we're uh, looking at reconcile your answers to F. So F is which one? The, the um, distance from Salt Lake City north of the origin. So um, you can look at the coordinate. So the distance from Salt Lake City north to the origin, I get 1,975 kilometers. Um, and then if you look at... Uh, Question I is calculating the coordinates of each of those points, and it should give those. Uh, it should give the y coordinate in meters, and uh, if you convert it to kilometers, it's about 2,083. So there's a difference of about um, 150 kilometers, and I believe that is due to the uh, spheroid versus uh, sphere approximation. Okay. So it is, uh, it is framed correctly, I think. But it's, it's the north-south distance from the latitude of origin up to the latitude of Salt Lake City that we're looking for. But hang on, in, in F, let me just make sure I know what I'm talking about here. F should be the north-south distance from the latitude of origin to Salt Lake City. Okay, there you go. So the latitude of origin, let's see. so this is the USA contiguous Albers equal area conic projection. So that has a reference latitude of 23 degrees. 23. Mm -hmm. So the question number F then is asking you to calculate the distance that Salt Lake City is north of 20 degree, 23 degrees and using the formula about the arc of the Earth. And the question um, I is producing a coordinate. Once you've got the projected coordinates for Salt Lake City, there is a Y value of that, which means that is the, the, the Y value above the latitude of origin. So um, when you add the, um, when you do this, you choose this particular projection here in the, pro 
when you're doing the project function of these data, um, and then when you use the um, add geometry at this point, you come out with numbers and that, that y value. That's the two that you have to that you have to compare. So thank you for that clarification. That's there's a lot of subtleties in this business, that's for sure. Are there any other questions about homework number one? Have you all? Uh, yes. Um, can you kind of explain number two? Number two. Number two. Okay, so this one here. So uh, the purpose of this is to be able to calculate. Well, what, what particular aspect of it is confusing? Let me. Let me. Uh, it's kind of one of the better understanding. Okay. So, uh, what we want you to do is to calculate the distances AB and BC in the manner that we've described in the lecture for a cell which is located in Houston and in, oh, sorry, not we're still about Houston. Uh, for, let's see. Well, it's, it's Logan, Salt Lake City and Logan. I mean, yeah, Logan, Logan and Austin. Yeah, Logan and Austin. So basically, we just want to cal you to calculate this distance and that distance and take the product of those to get the area and compare the two in Logan and Austin. Yeah. And there was a question at your end, David, about the homework? Um, I had a couple of... In doing this number two, I had at least one student have trouble. Um, and uh, you have to be really careful whether you're using radians or degrees. Uh -huh. Right. If you have the numeric value in degrees, but you put it into an Excel formula that's expecting radians, you don't get the right answer. So if you're using Excel, it's by default, I think, assumes angles are radians, so you have to uh, pay attention to that. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's a good point. So uh, this is my solution for the great circle distance. And uh, it's, it, I found this a... It's a tedious thing and it's hard to get it exactly right, so I, what I do is I just pound it out. So I started off with this column that says latitude in decimal degrees and longitude in decimal degrees. Then I multiplied those by pi over 180 to get latitude and radians and longitude and radians. And then I took those numbers and translated down into a table that says Salt Lake City in New York, point A, point B. And the phi number is the latitude, so I transpose the 0 0.711 down here to 0 0.711, etc., 0 0.7106. And then I calculated sine phi here, which is this, the part of the formula, which is sine A and then sine B there. And then cos phi, which is this part, I calculated those there. And then I transcribed the longitude and radians, the LA, lambda A and lambda B, I translated those down here. And then I took the difference between them and I took the cosine of that. And in other words, I just sort of hammered it all out exactly following this formula. If you try to sort of substitute everything in and you know, make one giant formula in Excel, there's just one little subtle mistake and you're, you're doomed. Uh, so, yeah, don't go there. And also, as Dr. Tarbaton mentioned, um, and I verified also that in Excel, cosine and sine are being done with radians. So everything has to be in radians. You can't get away with using degrees. It used to be, and in fact it still is, with hand calculators. Sometimes they're in degrees and sometimes they're in radians. And so you've got to run a check. And the check that I always run is I, I, I check sine 30 is 0.5. Well, cosine of 60 is 0.5. And so if you put in 60 and say cosine and it doesn't come out to 0.5, or sine and it doesn't come out to 0.5, of 30, then you know you've got to be working with radians. So, yeah. So this is my f solution for how to do this great circle distance thing. Um, it's it's like other things in engineering. You've got to be you've got to be really systematic. But if you are, then everything works out great. Are there any other questions about the homework? Yes. Question number. H. Okay, H. There's a question. H. Okay, yes. Comment on the difference between answers E and G. Okay. 
Um, so the, what accounts for the difference is the fact that, well, for a start, the latitudes are nearly the same, but they're not exactly the same. So a great, great circle distance between Salt Lake and New York is practically going to be flying along a parallel, uh, but not exactly. So this is, there's a slight um, difference there uh, because of that. And the, the great circle distance you know, goes from any point to any point. So I think um, the, the distinction is like, I think it's 3,190 kilometers to 3,160 something is what the numbers that I got. So it's about 30 kilometers different. Um, Dr. Tabaton, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. I, I've got the same 30 kilometer difference, which I found surprisingly small. I mean, the Great Circle is effectively taking this sort of shortcut towards the north, um, whereas the, the other one is going straight along the, um, the parallel. Um, so it should be a little bit longer. You've got an approximation in the one along the parallel in that you're assuming, assuming a sphere. Uh, and we don't know exactly what that approximation. I you know you're doing both of the. You both of them are assuming a sphere. So, yeah, yeah. There's um, nothing. There's nothing uh, to do with a sphere in this. Um, so I, th I think for the great circle uh, route to have a benefit, um, you actually have to be travelling longer distances than uh, the distance from distance from here to New York. Your which is not surprising. Yeah, well, perhaps at an oblique angle too. I mean the. Um, that, that would help. Any other questions about homework one? Yes, Perry. In the sustainable aims, mm -hmm. like default, all these things is given as zero. Yes. If all these things is given as zero. Uh huh. In the table. Yes. But uh, in the presentation that day, we had uh, fifty thousand people. Okay, so the question has to do with the false easting. Um, and the false easting is not a fixed quantity. It varies from one projection to another. So in this instance, the values are false easting is zero and the false northing is zero, and that's for the USA contiguous albers, whatever, you know, that, this particular projection. Um, when you do the projected coordinates uh, in further down in the homework, you'll find that the x-coordinate for Salt Lake City is a negative number. It's minus something. I've forgotten what now. Um, and in the, th so this is the ALBA's, uh, the contiguous United States version of the ALBA's projection. So ALBA's contiguous ALBA's area conic USGS version coordinates. And uh, that's because it's got these 29.5 and 45.5 as the parallels. There's other variations which have slight changes to those numbers. Um, in the transverse Mercator projection, the false easting there is 500,000. Then that's so that there will be no negative x coordinates. So that Salt Lake City would never be negative in the universal transverse Mercator projection because the false x is 500,000. Or well, false easting is 500,000, so even when you go to the left of that, you still have positive numbers. So, it, but once in the transverse Mercator system, it can become, you know, you can go past zero, for example, but by that time you're in another zone. That's the significance of the zones. So that's why there are only three degrees on either side of the central meridian, and in that range you don't ever go negative. Yeah, so this, so it's, there's a subtle thing here about um, this false easting and false northing thing. Um, in the projections for Texas, for example, they rig it so that the origin looks like it's down in Mexico somewhere. <laughs> and our numbers are always positive for, the, for Texas because of that. They make a big false easting and false northing, even in the millions. It's, it's a uh, I'm sorry? Yes. We are dividing it into six degrees and In this exercise, we're not using the UTM projection, but that's uh, in other applications we do. Like, we are dividing the area into six degree zones. Where's that? M, okay. Let me I, go. Think, I think I, I did ask them a question to figure ah. out which... Uh, oh, you're right. Times. I apologize. Yes, you are. You're mixing the two projections. Yep. And there's lots more as well. Yeah, so one of the 
things that you have to get used to when you're using GIS is that there, is, there are multiple objections and you've got to work from one to another. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. Any other questions about homework one? And there's a lot in this homework, actually. So if you get on top of this, then you'll be in pretty good shape, actually. Uh, it takes a while to sort of sort through all these things and get comfortable with calculating distances and sines and cosines and areas and things, but yes. Because this central meridian has a reference that it do, we talk about these only in the case of UTM, I guess. I'm sorry, the central meridian. That is the question number A, uh, where we're talking about the intersection of central meridian and reference. Yes, yes. So I guess these terms come up only in case of UTM. Or in so, okay, so the, the nature of the question is when do you have a central meridian and when do you have a lat latitude of origin? You always have those, always. So there is always a central meridian and a latitude of origin. All projections have them, all projections, yeah. So um, uh, even azimuthal projections have a central meridian and a latitude of origin, and that's the point where the, where the plane touches the Earth. So all projections have a central meridian and a reference latitude. But conic projections have in addition the standard parallel one and standard parallel two <coughs> where the cone cuts the Earth. But for the cylindrical projection, you don't have that because it doesn't cut the Earth anywhere. So the cylindrical projection, or at least the transverse Mercator projection, which is cylindrical like this, it's got a central meridian, which is the place where the cone, where the sphere of the Earth touches the cylinder, and it has a reference latitude that's arbitrarily chosen to be the equator. So that yeah, so if you just imagine this, the cylinder, and it's rotating around the Earth, and it stops every six degrees. And there's a meridian that it's stopping on that touching, just touches the Earth. And then the equator is the reference latitude in all cases for that projection. Um, yeah, so these central meridian and reference latitude or latitude of origin always exist. doesn't matter what the projection is. Yes, it is. In this case, there's zero and zero. Any other questions about homework one? Sorry, yes. it just sounded like you were using reference latitude and latitude of origin interchangeably. That's correct. Okay. I am. Yeah, so sometimes you use the terms reference latitude and sometimes latitude of origin and it means the same thing. Um, central meridian is always central meridian. I don't think there's a synonym for that. Um, I don't know why latitude. Um, well, the, the fact that there's a... Um, you have to have a point on the Earth in latitude longitude coordinates corresponds to a point on the Earth in the projected coordinate systems by definition. Otherwise, ha you have to, to translate the coordinates. That's why the central meridian and latitude of origin always exist. Okay, sort of like having, you know, if you've got x, y axes on a chart, you've got to have some point where they get measured from. Any other questions? This thing that says here EPSG, that says authority, that means the European Petroleum Society or something. And for some reason, this European Petroleum Society uh, decided to put numbers on all the map projections. And so, for whatever reasons, that became the industrial standard. That's why it's got this EPSG here and this 4269. That means that projection is uniquely numbered in the system. Any other questions about this? Anything you want to add, Dr. Tarberton? Well, there's another number there that says WKID. Uh -huh. That stands for well-known identifier. Ah. So there's a sort of a, I mean, there's a, the numbers, the, the EPSG numbers have become sort of universally used, so they're just referred to as well-known identifiers, without really saying who the authority is. There we go. I didn't know that, so I learned something today. Thank you. Any other questions or ideas? So you're, um, I went through the exercise that uh, Dr. Tarleton had put out for being able to uh, register your file in HydraShares, this, this set of instructions that we talked about last time, and he corrected. So I filed the proposal document. Uh, that I prepared for this class as a document in HydraShare, and he found it. So, yep, I verified that it, this works, and uh, so I hope that you can load your
proposal in HydraShare as well as putting it on Canvas. And any questions about doing that? It's basically a system the same like ArcGIS Online. You apply for a um, membership and you get a confirming email and you've got to say, yes, I am really who I say I am. And then off you go. And it's really pretty simple. Um, okay. Do you want to comment on this any further, Dr. Tarleton, about your homework instructions and HydraShare? Um, no, but if anybody has any trouble, they're welcome to send email. Yeah. I actually, when I was doing this, my browser locked up at one point, and so I killed it and just started off again. And I found that my my progress had been stored, even though my browser didn't support it all the way through. So it worked out okay. Okay, so let's continue on then. Um, I want to uh, just show a few slides that come from the previous lecture and also the one before to reinforce some points in the exercise. Uh, and first I want to show you this. I've got a friend uh, uh, who works for the uh, National Association of Public Safety, GIS, and they, uh, have, they have currently going on, because of all these hurricanes, a volunteer GIS effort where GIS specialists in different places are finding photos and making a crowdsourced map of hurricane impacts. And there are hundreds of pictures in there. So in this, I've put this review slides on, the, on my website, and I just got this uh, this morning, actually. And so these are uh, crowdsourced photographs from different hurricanes, but the main focus is on uh, this hurricanes that are currently going on. So it says 567 there. Uh, that's uh, in, near Wilmington, North Carolina. So they've got here 174 photos, and you can go into any place in, in Wilmington, and you can find places where there's like little darts. So there's something here, and here's a uh, here's a photo of what's going on at East Boiling Springs Road, and they've got a little story here about East Boiling Springs Road. It's just incredible. It's just all this has been done by volunteer effort people finding photos that have been put on YouTube and who knows where and posting them or referencing them uh, with, with this single map so you can see uh, what's going on. And I think this is actually pretty good public service. I mean, yeah, you can really find out what's going on here. This is somebody's bringing it all together. And basically the interesting part about it is that it's being brought together by volunteers. It's not, this is not anybody's kind of official system. Uh, perhaps some. Let's, let's see. So this is Twitter. This is Twitter. Ah, there you go, Twitter. Um, so I guess you have to. What's that? Ah, play option. It's a screenshot. Yeah, yeah. So. So that, that Twitter link has a lake dot at the beginning of it. If you deleted that, it might work. Uh, I'm sorry, that David, if I deleted what? Twitter link had a lake dot at the beginning of the address that shouldn't have been there. So if you deleted the lake dot at the URL at the top of the browser, after you click on that, go and delete the lake dot before HTTPS and see if that works. Your search did not match any value. Okay. Well, anyway. Okay, well, yeah. it's the picture's nice anyway. So yeah, it looks, <laughs> looks like this is a screen capture. Yeah, so there's something I guess lost um, in the process, but um, I still I still think this is a pretty cool thing. Um, then uh, I've I just recalled to mind these slides here that um, that we had gone over earlier. Oops. Doesn't look like that's mm -hmm. yeah, look like I'm para paralyzed my uh, PowerPoint by doing that, but anyway, let me just start this up again. So 
just to remind you about these formulas here that we have went over earlier that were involved with um, uh, with the homework one and actually um, the, the, because you can only calculate cosines with radians probably we should say cosine and then the angle here in radians in this formula cosine of 30 um, doesn't uh, oh. and then we've got We've got this uh, rather complicated formula here that I went over in Excel how to do it. Um, we missed out these slides from the presentation uh, last time because I was asking you questions about where to find data sources, but I want to go over them anyway just as a background to exercise two. So the United States is divided into water resource regions, and these are the water resource regions, and the ones that one that we're going to be working with data from is this one called the Texas Gulf. And this is the highest level of drainage area delineation for the country. So these are sort of big chunks of drainage that a long time ago the US Geological Survey decided this is the way the country is going to be um, recognized. And within that, there is a hierarchy of watersheds in increasingly smaller pieces and in this exercise we're going to see um, all of these or many of these levels. So we start off with this water resource region 2 which is re we're in 12 actually which is the two digit huck and this four digit, six digit, eight, ten and twelve and the progressively smaller units that fit inside each one and as you go along um, you'll see how this subdivision works. So in this case there's a huck unit of huck 8, 03030002 that means it gives de designated values for each of these first four levels. And then this is a HUC-12 unit, which means it has designated values for the last two. So there's this whole hierarchical system in increasingly small uh, unit areas. Um, this is the National Hydrography data set that's been divided here into eight-digit HUC watersheds. And the National Hydrography data set is just the blue line rivers and water bodies and things around them. Um, we're going to use that information in this exercise. A part of the process in the National Hydrography data set is the definition of unique identifiers. And so in this exercise, we're going to use unique identifiers that are in the National Hydrography data set called COMID. Uh, and the same number is used in the National Water Model. So at the end of the exercise, I'm asking you to get forecasts for a particular number and that's the number that's being referred to. This is called a reach code, and it's an addressing system. So there's an addressing system on the river system of the country that just says, I'm on a particular reach. In this case, it's 03030002. That means it's in an eight-digit huck unit. And it's 1925. That means it's the 1925th reach within that. <coughs> so there's, it's like, I live at 3728 Josh Lane. And, uh, Josh, this is like the streets of the country. There is such a thing for rivers. And another thing that's important about the National Hydrography data set is that they have estimated the mean annual flow and the mean annual flow velocity for all these streams. And we're going to use that um, mean annual flow as a way of symbolizing the stream so that you can see big rivers differentiated from smaller ones. So I wanted to point that out. Then from the National Hydrography data set, there was developed this data set called the NHD+. And this is really the key development. Um, each of these data sets, elevation, hydrography, watersheds, and land cover, took about 10 years to accomplish, from about 1995 to 2005. And then it took about 10 more years to bring them all together, so that we had this NHD plus data set with the 2.7 million reach catchments in the country. Um, the average area is three square kilometers and the average length is two kilometers. That's what's used for the national water model. We're also going to use the national land cover data from 2011. This has been uh, interpreted from Landsat data in 1992, 2001, 2006 and 2011. And there are nice products now about uh, quantifying land cover change over five year periods between those um, intervals. So that's just some sort of a review here um, about the essential data that we're going to use in exercise two. So I'm going to do exercise two, but probably not all of it because you can follow it along yourself. And uh, I'll just try to highlight 
uh, some of the key points of that. So the, the idea of this is to build a watershed base map. So the purpose of doing this exercise at this point in the class is that you're just starting to get going on a project and this kind of a uh, exercise of establishing a base map for your area is something that you all need to do. And this is a water-oriented base map. Uh, some of you I know are doing different kind of projects. Now it happened that a couple of years ago when we were doing this class, we were, we'd just been working on building the prototype of the National Water Model and we produced this map in ArcGIS Online. And if you open up this map, it comes out and shows you the regions of the country. And the one that we're going to be working with is this region 12. We merged all these ones together here for the Mississippi Basin because it all flows together, even though the USGS has them broken into pieces. And we've got, if you click on this, it says more info. And if you go to more info, it switches from ArcGIS Online map to the hydroshear system. Ta-da! And one of my students, her name was Cassandra Fagan, uh, she filed in, under hydroshear the data that we use for the National Water Model Development for each of the different regions. And so there's a geodatabase here called NIFI Geo 12, that means region 12, uh, and it's a zipped geodatabase and it's contained within this thing called a zipped bagot Archive, and I don't know what that is. David, can you tell me what a zipped bagot archive is? So that's a, a formal uh, data structure for preserving uh, digital objects in the sort of digital library world. And if you were actually to download that zipped bagot archive, you would see that it's got XML files for the metadata and the resource map as well as uh, formal checksums and things uh, that are part of the, the library of, or the system used by the Library of Congress. So you'll see there's a readme file there that will explain it, and those other files uh, will uh, talk a little bit about it. So if you open that readme file, um, okay. there it explains, explains a little bit about, about what the various files, files are, and then you see that buried down in the data folder there's a resource map and a resource metadata file that will hold things like the, the abstract and the keywords and the authors of the particular resource. So it's, it's bundling along the metadata together with the data to uh, archive things in, the, in a sort of formal way. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I've learned something new. So data, huh, resource metadata, look at that. Whoops. Notepad, so right? you could look at, choose, okay, choose a, choose a, a browser. Okay, the wrong thing there. Whoops, oh, now it's automatic. Uh, it's, now it's remembered. Mm. Uh, open with, uh, oh, I guess, choose Microsoft Edge will work at the top. Okay, there you go. So there you can see Cassandra Fagan as the creator, the organization she was at was University of Texas at Austin. There's her email address, um, the date it was created, and the, for example, the, the right statement saying it was shared under Creative Commons. So this is the sort of formal metadata associated with this particular hmm. resource. Well, that's cool. So this is all the, the HydroShares resource data model, the, the, the way that we are structuring information in HydroShares. So when students post their term projects, they're effectively creating all this as well? Yes. When they enter the abstract on the, on the box on the website, this information will get captured. Hmm. Yeah, so this is, it's sort of an interesting thing. This is how the academic community is starting to document itself on the web and creating descriptions about what information is and how to get at it in, in really highly structured ways. Uh, and this is part of a larger movement called the digital library movement. So libraries are doing this too. So we're sort of, you know, a little piece of the digital library uh, movement at some level. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So I, I just regard all this as like a mystery. And you know, Dr. Tarverton knows the secrets of this mystery, but not me. But anyway, there you go. <laughs> so that's... Uh, hmm? So the reason XML is used is it's intended to be machine readable. So this is part of the effort to make these resources not only human readable through the landing page, but also machine to machine readable. So this could sort of participate, 
you could have one computer system read this, interpret these, and create links to to other systems. It's all part of the sort of web services uh, evolution of uh, linked data on the internet. Yeah. At the, at the risk of a um, little bit of a diversion here, I, I gave a lecture last Friday uh, for a uh, public audience here in Austin about Hurricane Harvey. And in, in that, I was talking about the idea of creating an internet of water for Texas. So this is the same sort of thing, but just for water data itself, as distinct from uh, resources. And so earlier in our career, Dr. Tabberton and I were involved with the creation of a water markup language. And here's an example. This is how the US Geological Survey lays out. The water markup language has year, month, day, hour, minute, second, and then the Times the time offset, and so this is a call to the Colorado River at Austin, and boom, that's the data set for the last day, and so at 2:08:9:18 at 12:40 p.m., the flow of the Colorado River at Austin was 401 cubic feet per second, and that's that information is available for any gauging station in the United States, and now New Zealand has adopted this whole system as well. So this is common language for water data, uh, for water time series data, which is also in XML, but in a customized design form of XML. Um, we developed a relationship with the World Meteorological Organization. And in fact, going on today in Geneva, there's a meeting at the World Meteorological Organization that's looking at next steps to how, how all this water language can be advanced in the future with different components to it. So this language, XML language, or extended markup language, it's used for HTML for the regular web, it's being used here for water data, and it's being used in the other thing that Dr. Tabberton was showing for resource descriptions on HydroShare. This is how the internet works, actually. It's by the design and implementation of standardized languages, what, like what you see here. So, well, I apologize for a small diversion there, but that's that I happen to be giving a lecture this morning in, in for the people in Geneva. Um, so, it's, so here, so I've, you go to this map, you go to more info, you download this big file that you just saw. Um, so you, you, what you initially end up with is this thing, which this is a, a GUID, is that right? Is that why it's got this horrible looking address on it? That's a GUID, yes. Yes. So, so who knows what a GUID is? Identifier. Good. Okay, GUIDs are important. GUIDs are globally unique identifiers. So there's this system that looks up the clock inside your computer or something, and it generates a number. So when you want a, a random number that's that is always unique, that's a GUID. And so that's how things, uh, packages of information are uniquely identified in the internet is using GUIDs. And if you, un if you unzip this, then you get this, these folders, and it goes data, contents. Then you get down to this thing, which is still zipped, actually. So you unzip it again. There's two unzips involved. And that gives you the NIFI Geo, which is the geo database that you need for the exercise. So it's a bit obscure when you get this. You've got to sort of dig down to get it. But nevertheless, it's there. So if we open up ArcGIS Pro here. Um, so, get, get the map, get the data, download it, unscramble everything, you know, open up with a map, and we'll just add the data to this map. So, I'm going to start with a blank project and put it in an area that I've established on this called demo. Takes a while to think about that. So I'm going to store this in demo and we're going to call this exercise 2. And 
if we add the map and then add the data. Now these data have been, it defaults back to where we were when we did exercise one. So let's just come here, go to exercise two. And uh, I'm going to, here's the Niffy Geo Geodatabase. So I'm just going to go there and look inside of it. And there's a, there's a feature data set here called Geographic that contains all the data that you see um, here. So I'm just going to add this whole data set to the map in one hit. And so it's got little catchments, it's got larger sub-watersheds, it's got water bodies, it has flow lines, it has stream gauges. We're not going to worry about the other things, we're just going to worry for the moment about the sub-watersheds here and locating ourselves correctly. So this is Water Resource Region 12. Are you proud to be in Water Resource Region 12? Yes, yes we're proud. We're Region 12ers, yeah. Um, so this is all the rivers... Near Street 16. Well, I guess that's, that's kind of neat too. <laughs> to be 16, yeah, sweet 16, and oh, I won't go there. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, uh, and you've got a whole series of feature classes here, and we're just going to worry about, for the moment, just the, water sh the sub watersheds feature class. This is actually the Huck system. Um, so, I'm going to color this in with uh, unique values, and so if we just go to sub-watershed and go to symbology, and we're going to say unique values by Huck 8. And there's more than 100 unique values, and say yes. And so this is a layout um, across the country of, uh, well, of uh, across Region 12 of these uh, feature classes, which actually are designated by Huck 8 units, but there's actually Huck 12 features inside of there. So if we come back here and get this map that you see, and if you take a look inside the catalog, uh, then you've got this, um, let's just check it out here. So, session six, um, X2. So under demo, we've got now exercise two, and we've got a, a database catalog here. Um, and we're going to establish a new feature data set in that geodatabase. So uh, if we come back here and go to catalog and say, okay, databases, exercise two, we've got nothing there right now. We're going to right click on this and say new feature data set. And the purpose of that is to establish a spatial reference. In this case, it's just going to be geographic coordinates. But a geodatabase can hold data in different projections. So you can have UTM, you can have USGS Albers, and so on, as well as geographic data sets. And we're going to call this feature data set San Marcos. And we're going to use the geographic coordinate system of 1983. We're going to choose the coordinate system for sub-watershed, which happens to be geographic coordinate system of 1983. And so we're going to just say run. And now if we look at the catalog, we've got this little packaging unit here. This is where the feature classes are going to go. Later on, there's rasters and tables that are produced in this exercise, and they're not included in this feature data set here. So if we've got that, then we're set up here to do some things. So now we're going to select the watersheds that are in the San Marcos Basin. Um, and to do that, we're going to... This is the first... Um, uh, important thing that we're going to learn here is uh, if we open up the attribute table you'll see that there's Huck 8, Huck 10 and Huck 12 watersheds that are associated with these units that you see in the pictures um, and we're going to select the values for one Huck 8 unit and we're going to say select by attributes. Later we're going to say select by location. So these are the two ways you can make selections. Select by attributes looks at tables and looks at numerical values and makes choices on that basis Select by location looks at geographic areas and you make choices on that basis. Uh, so it's important that you understand or that, you, that you're comfortable with doing both of those things. So we're going to say select by attributes and we're going to select attributes of the sub-watersheds. 
So if we come back here and we say, okay, sub-watershed, select by attributes, and then you get a sub-watershed feature class here. We're going to have a new selection. Then you add a clause. In this, in this case, we're going to say huck8 is equal to the huck unit that we want here, which I happen to know is 12100203. So there you go. So you need to know which huck8 you live in. 12100203. So we're going to use that one. That happens to be the huck8 unit for the San Marcos watershed. And when you do this, you may look like you've finished what you had to do when you got to this far, but you have to say add. And if you don't say add and get one of these boxes, the selection just selects everything. But with that, if you say run, then these little units show up here. So we've now got the sub areas identified that we're interested in. And if you look at the attribute table and you say click selected, it just shows the 32 out of the 4,159 4, of these little units, HUC12 units that correspond to this base. What was the? It's 12100203. Yeah, it's in the script, but I happen to know, yeah, I just happen to know it off by heart now. Uh, <laughs> well, you've done it about 50 times. Yeah, yeah, we've, we always use the San Marcos base. And 12100203. There you go. If you're following along, I guess that's, that's what you're doing. So, if you come back to ArcMap and then come over here to this little box here, which is something I learned while I was preparing this exercise, there's this thing here that says zoom to selection. Oh, that's cool. Uh, you can see now close up uh, what we've got. And then we can then export those data to the geodatabase that we've just created for exercise <laughs> two. So sub-watershed, data, export features, and those are now going to come over here and we're going to call them uh, just sub-watershed, the same as So Didn't you want to put it inside the uh, feature data? Yeah, case? that's a good point. So let's just go there and make sure I do that. So it's here, San Marcos. Oops, this container is empty. So they now just type sub watershed down with his name. Okay, so to no, make sure it goes first, inside. Into San Marcos first. Yeah, to make sure that it goes inside the feature data set and not just inside the geodatabase, it's best, as Dr. Tabadon is saying, you navigate here and then say save and then say run. I think you still maybe didn't get it right. Oh, what am I? I'm just yeah. a clueless person. <laughs> it's okay. So, so let's... It's, a, it's, a, it's fine. Yeah, so I didn't get it right. So, so let me just... I'll, well, never mind. I, I didn't get it right. So it doesn't matter that much whether I got it right or not, as it turns out. So don't worry about this too much. Okay, there, so... There's another subtle thing that you might also want to point out is that... Yeah. We were running a, a tool over here on the right, uh -huh. and of course we had a selection of uh, the, the features in the layer selected. The tool acts only on the selected layers. That's true. If That's we didn't have a selection active, active, it would act on all of them. So you have to pay attention to what you've got selected or not when you're running tools. So because I goofed up, have I got it right this time? No, you have to click on the San Marcos uh, at the top. Okay. Click on it to open it. Double click. Now, now you've got it right. Thank you very much. Okay. I didn't realize that. So, yeah, I knew I was, when I was working on this, I was getting it messed up. So, well, yeah. So let's run it and see if I got it right this time. Okay. And so let's check back and see at the catalog. Oh, look at that. Perfect. So that's, there's a little subtlety there about just how you open up that, um, the San Marcos feature data set inside the lookup so that you get it correctly located. So now that we've got this set up here, it's back in our picture again, we're going to take these sub-watersheds and just remove them uh, from the chart. And we've got a, I'm going to take these and um, just make an, I'll just make an outline here and we'll make this in green. So I always like to have these things in green. So mm -hmm. let's save the project. Now, um, so now we've got 
everything lined up correctly. Um, one of the other uh, things that we can take a check at, if we just click one of these sub-order sheds here, you'll see this is a HUC-12 unit, 12102203, now 0101. If we click this one, it's 0102. So you can see this, uh, little, this little system here, 0104 and so on. So in fact, there's HUC-10 units and HUC-12 units that are embedded within this single one HUC-8 HUC unit. So if we come back here, and we can change the symbology so that these things are coloured in, in <coughs> according to the HUC-10 units that they lie in. So if we come here and say, again, symbology, and say, draw uh, unique values, in this case we're going to use the HUC-10 unit as our unique uh, identifier. And, yep, that looks like it. Seems like there was a, used to be an apply here, but I don't see any, any apply anymore. Anyway, this is, you can see that we've now got a HUC 8 unit around the whole thing, then HUC 10 units, and then HUC 12 units within those. So let's save this. So it seems like an ArcGIS Pro 2.2, they just automatically apply the symbology without you having to say apply, which is what you used to have to do. So that's probably an improvement in the software. So there's some properties here that if you just take the um, catalog and look at sub-watershed properties, you can look at where the source of the information is and where the data are stored. That's always helpful to know that. Um, now we're going to create a boundary, and this is rather an interesting display here, which actually I was used to using this in a different way, so I learned some things as I was doing this. So if we go to analysis, this is where geoprocessing gets exposed. And if you look at this little panel here and just expand it, you go, oh, look, I've got all these really cool things I can do without having to sort of search around in the toolbox. In this case, we're going to use dissolve. And we're going to have as input features uh, sub-watershed. We're going to, and we're going to call the output feature class Basin, and I guess I've got to do the same thing as I did before, right? To ah, so it orders. the right? Yeah, it's all automatically going to the feature data set now. So let's call this basin. Once you've done it correctly to the first time, uh, it's uh, there. I think it goes correctly after that. So then we're going to say the dissolve here is by huck eight. So since all these have the same huck eight number, and say run. So now we've got this thing called basin, and it's going to have no color, and it's going to be green. So apply. Now we've got a boundary around this uh, system. If we come back to catalog, there you go. So the second time you put something in, you don't have to mess around so much to get it in the right place. Basin's in the right place compared to San Marcos. Okay, so we've got a basin. We've dissolved out and got a boundary. Um, then, now we're going to do an exercise concerning the land cover of the San Marcos Basin, and we're going to do that with data from the Living Atlas. So, uh, if we go back to map and say add data to the map, in this case we're going to go to the Living Atlas, and we're going to search for NLCD. And we're going to use National Land Cover Data Set of 2011. It's taking a while to think about that. And the information. Well, while this is coming up, let me just say a few words about the um, classification system of these data. So th this comes out and you get this rather long description here of all the different land cover types. Uh, I looked up on the web the uh, definition of these and it's located at this location on the web. If you go there then you get a definition of what the National Land Cover Database classification means. We don't have all of these, feature, these types. For example, we don't have lichens, for example. Uh, not too many lichens in the San Marcos Basin. 
So uh, here's the land cover data set that's been downloaded from the, or at least we're viewing it from the um, National Land Cover Data Set in the Living Atlas. <coughs> so let's turn off the sub-watersheds and we just have the basin. And we're going to use a function called extract by mask. So if we come back here. Yeah. And so one of the things I learned, actually another thing I learned was that if you click this little button up here when you're in geo processing, you can go open another tool. Oh, that's cool. In this case, we're going to say extract by mask. And the input raster, we've only got one, National Land Cover 2011. And the output raster I've called uh, land cover, just as one word. Oops, that wasn't a good idea, input raster. Ah, so and then we have to have the mask, I'm sorry. Uh, the mask here is the basin. So this is, it says I'm going to take out all the cells that are inside this basin. And I'm going to call this output raster just land cover. And say run. <laughs> and what's happening here is that all the cells, these are 30 meter cells, are extracted out from the, the big data set to produce a smaller one. So we're just going to say remove this one. And now we've got the land cover data set already set up here. If we go to catalog, and now look, you'll see this land cover thing exists. So in addition to our feature classes inside the featured data set, we now have this land cover data set. So that's a success. So we've now got to this point. Um, there's a discussion here about the source of these data, and they're essentially 30 meter cells, because you're asked to calculate areas later on. And this raster has a attribute table associated with it. It's called a value attribute table. So when you're working with rasters, each of these cells has a particular value. So if you just click anywhere in the map, you get, whoops, I've got a huck eight unit there. Uh, well, never mind, let's not worry about it. Each cell has a value and they count the number of cells with common values. So this is, there are 2,200, 22,953 cells that have value 11 and that represents open water. These colors over here represent the symbology of what, how it's colored in on the map. And so this is the value and the count tell you how many, what's the distribution of land cover in this um, particular area. Now there's a question in the homework and you're asked to summarize these land cover categories according to main categories of land cover, not this subdivided one. So I've transcribed out of that web page I showed you these main categories and then I've shown you how you can add a field to the database I've called it main class here and you can then save that and you come back to your attribute table and you've got a new thing that says main class and if you click on these values you can add in the value the different main classes just add in the new field just keep on going doing that at the end you say edit save and you save that and now we're going to say summarize now in order to avoid going through all the pointing and clicking and everything I'm going to add that result from what I have already calculated when I was preparing the exercise so if we come here and go to exercise 2 test exercise 2 exercise 2 so I'm going to bring this one and if I open the attribute table for that one you'll see this thing main class already exists here so this is once you've done that you've got this new thing called main class and I'm going to say here summarize and this is something that's really useful I, I use this a lot so here we've got main class summarize and uh, you have to put in how you're going to do the summary. So we're going to say we want the field to be main, sorry, we want the field to be value and we want the statistic that's to be calculated as sum 
and we want the case field to be main class. So what that does is it sums up all the counts here. Sorry, I should have count here. And then the value, it sums up all the counts that are in each of these main class units. That's what the meaning of case field is. So if you run that, then you've got a table that tells you about land cover statistics. And if you open that, it tells you the number of cells in each of the main classes. And you're asked in the exercise to uh, make a map of the land cover, prepare a table for the area and square kilometers of each of the land cover classes. And because the cells are 30 meter in size and you've got the count of the number of cells, you can calculate the area in square kilometers of what the uh, land cover represents. Um, so the next part we're going to do is to um, find the flow lines and catchments for this. And in doing that, we're going to use the select by location feature. So let's take out the land cover for the moment. I'm not going to worry about that anymore. And so we'll take the flow lines. So here are the flow lines. And you, you look at this and you can't really see very much. So we're going to recolor the flow lines. And we're going to use a flow attribute in doing that. Oh, hang on. No, first, we're going to do a selection. That's a better idea. OK, so we're here. And we can't really see these flow lines. So we're going to say, let's make them a nice blue color. So now we've got lots and lots of flow lines. Now we're going to say select by location. And we say select location flow line that have their center in. Right down the bottom here is have their center in. So the selecting feature is basin. I use this a lot. And then you say run. And look at that. Isn't that magic? Select by location. Yeah, that's so cool. And now we're going to export those data to our feature data set that we had. Um, yeah, we're going to put them here and we're going to call them flow line. Say save and run. And now we'll take out the big flow line data set that we had before and we're just left with the small one. To make this easier to interpret, we're going to um, Symbolize it using a field called Q001C. That's the mean annual flow field. There's various versions of this. So we're going to use Q001C. So if I go to symbology and say graduated symbols, and we use Q001C as the attribute, and we're going to make it a blue color. They apply, and now we've got a nice little map. Oh, look at that. We've got nice small streams and bigger streams and so on. Let's get some sort of sense out of the whole map. This is the Blanco River, and that becomes the San Marcos River as it goes downstream. And this one over here is called Plum Creek. Later on, you get to work with those a little bit. Uh, similarly, we're going to take the catchments, and we're going to select the catchments out of this whole data set. Select by location the catchment feature data set that lies with their centers within the basin. Say run. We've got those selected. And we're going to take the catchments and say export those. And as Dr. Carbiton said earlier, when you've got a set of data already selected, just the selected values are the ones that are, that are exported, not all of them. So if we run that, and we've got our data exported, we can take these and remove them. And now we've got a nice little map um, of the San Marcos Basin. So this is uh, what we've been referring to as a base map, or just a sort of a general watershed base map for the San Marcos Basin with our sub-watersheds and our catchments and, and um, our streams and so on inside of that. OK, so the next, let's see, so what happens here? So here, 
Oh yeah, so we go to a particular location, which happens to be near Wimberley, Texas. If you want to locate yourself, you say, okay, I want to go to Wimberley, Texas. Why not? Who's been to Wimberley, Texas? Yeah, there you go. It's a, it's a nice little place just outside of Austin. Wimberley, Texas. Look at that. So there we are. We're right at Wimberley, Texas. If we turn this off, you'll see, yeah, we can just change the base map to a road base map to make it easier to see where we are, actually. Yes, this happens to be Wimberley. And we're just going to click on this um, <coughs> section of the Blanco River, and you'll see it's 1630223. And similarly here, if we look at this feature, it's feature ID 1630223, that's the catchment. So that's how the catchment that surrounds that particular um, flow line is identified uniquely. So let's save that. Now, the next part of the exercise, um, let's see, what are we doing? There's a, there's, a, there's a discussion here about producing a map frame and a layout and creating labels to put on the map with the Plum Creek and the San Marcos River and the Blanco River, which in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over. Um, there's also in this um, exercise, you're asked to calculate the average flow length of the flow line. So if we open the attribute table, go to across to the attribute to do that, length in kilometers, just right click and say summarize. In this case, we're going to eliminate this variable because we don't want to have a case length field. We just want to have length in kilometers and say mean. And if you run that, we get flow line statistics and it tells you how many flow lines there are and what the average length is. And you're asked some questions about that. How many catchments are there? How many? What's the average area? How many flow lines? What's the average length? And so on. The next thing is to create a point feature class of stream gauges. In this case, you've got latitude and longitude coordinates. And you have to make up an Excel file, rather like what you do for homework number one, and incorporate that within, uh, X, within ArcGIS. And you end up with some nice gauges like this. I remember when I first did this, it was a long time ago, but I was just really happy that I could create some data myself. And I thought, this is cool, you know, this is, I can do this. This is not just for somebody else. I can make my own data. I found that very satisfying. Um, you go through this, and the file that you create has these uh, names in it um, in Excel, and those enable you to label the gauges with which gauge, what the gauge name is. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over that as well. And I'm going to just go straight to the last part, which is the forecasting using the NOAA uh, National Water Model. So now we're off in NOAA world. and say, I understand. And you can zoom in, and it's not that, that difficult to find yourself, actually. So if you just zoom in here, down to uh, here's San Marcos. And you can sort of see a bit of a kink for the rivers, but if you change the base map to streets, now you can see San Marcos here, and here's Blanco, there's Wimberley. So you just zoom in here. And oh, by the way, look, there's the same reach that we were talking about just a moment ago. Now it's in the National Water Model forecast map. And we can say, okay, let's open a forecast chart. So this is the current forecast for the Blanco River not applicable for some reason. Take a minute or two to load up here. When I was trying it this morning, I had trouble with the Firefox browser and it worked in Chrome. So I don't know how it works in Internet Explorer, which you're using. Uh, well, that's a good question. So let's go back to... <laughs> Well, let's do it again in Chrome then. So to get this, you go water.noaa.gov slash map. I understand.
Now, so here we are again. Let's see if this works any better. Open the forecast chart. Ah, does work better. Okay, so this is the forecast chart. As it's this is the analysis in short range. So this says. Over the last few days, we've actually been having some quite significant flow variations here. We've been, we heard quite a bit of local rainfall. We add the medium range and say rebuild. Um, you can see that the expectation is that the flow is going to be dropping off for the next week or so. Now, you'll notice at the top here, um, it says Blanco River um, not applicable or something. If you go to Quick View, and don't ask me why this is the case. Then it says Blanco River, Wimberley 78676. So there you go, it gives a better title. So this somehow Quick View um, corrects the title as something better than it was before. But huh. <coughs> like this, maybe the forecast has changed. Anyway, there's a bit of a blip there now. Um, so anyway, uh, what we want you to do is to go to this particular place and get this particular forecast. And also to go down to the bottom of the San Marcos River. So if we um, uh, zoom to the layer and just go down to the bottom here, you're actually by the city of Gonzales, and there's another reach here, this one, which happens to be 163201017. So if we come back to the the map and get rid of this particular forecast. Return to the map interface. And zoom back a bit and come down to Gonzales. And what you find when you look at this particular reach, which is that one actually. Oops, no, not that one. Maybe it isn't. Yeah, 163217. Right. 16, Open the forecast chart. And here you see a bit better. Um, seems like here's a. That's actually, it's changed since I looked at it this morning, so there you go. So, what, what we've asked you to do is just to take these two points and look at the forecast information between these two points. Mm -hmm. And again, if it doesn't look right, CSS San Marcos River, Wimberley, that's wrong. So, it's a quick view. And then open the forecast chart again. It says San Marcos River Gonzalez, which is what it is. And medium and rebuild. And so the last part of the exercise here is to make a comparison between these two forecasts. And what we've asked you to do is oops, Yeah, what we've asked you to do at the end here is to compare the ratio of the forecast flows to the ratio of the drainage areas. So if you come back to the um, flow line feature class and open this up, one of the attributes that's a little bit further over here is something called total drainage area in square kilometers. There's lots of there's lots of stuff on this data. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So total drainage area and so area square kilometers is the area of the local catchment, and total drainage area in square kilometers is the total upstream area when you're looking all the way upstream. So you can get the drainage area of any one of the flow lines from this particular attribute. So there we are. That's the end of this exercise, and it's due in a week from today. Any thoughts to add, Dr. Tarbaton? Uh, no, I guess, uh, do you know what the difference is between total drainage area and div drainage area? Uh, that's a good question. Well, let's see what we've got here. So that, for that one that we were just looking at, 1632017, um, whoops, I should have got select. So I was, I was researching this the other day with the uh, watershed I was looking at, and the div one is supposed to account for braiding somehow in multiple paths. But it, I was unable to get, always, I didn't always get consistent uh, values between the one and the other. 
Okay, so what I understand is that this is the, this one's the local area and that one's the total area. I don't know what that one is. Yeah. Okay, I don't know the answer to that question. Let's declare victory here and next Thursday Dr. Tarleton is going to take over and talk about spatial analysis. Yes, it'll be good. <coughs>